Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Nicola Marzari from uh, uh, EPFL, and today I have uh, uh, the great honor and the great uh, pleasure uh, to introduce the 25th Marvel Distinguished Lecture uh, that will be given uh, by Dario Gil, a Senior Vice President and Director of IBM Research uh, on the Era of uh, Accelerated Materials Discovery. Uh, so Dario uh, is actually the 12th uh, Director of uh, IBM Research in his uh, 60, 76 uh, years uh, history. Uh, and it's one of the largest uh, uh, corporate research environment worldwide uh, with more than uh, uh, 3,000 uh, 3, researchers. In particular, uh, the Rio has uh, overseen the great uh, push for quantum computing within uh, IBM uh, with the first uh, programmable quantum computers available on the cloud. Uh, pushing uh, the agenda of uh, artificial intelligence uh, and uh, very much uh, exploratory science, as we'll see today in the world uh, of uh, uh, materials discovery. Uh, Dario is also the co-chair of the MIT IBM Watson Artificial Intelligence Lab. He co-chairs the, the COVID-19 High Performance Computing Consortium. Uh, but in particular, I think uh, uh, he has uh, an extremely prominent and important uh, role as member of the National Science Board. Uh, this is the governing body of the National Science Foundation. And uh, many of you will know that there has been a, um, a push uh, to actually greatly expand uh, the research and development investments in the US uh, with uh, you know, more than $100 billion in aggregate uh, planned for the next five years uh, to push exactly an innovation and technological agenda. Last but not least, Dario is core six. Uh, that actually means uh, he got his PhD in electrical engineering and computer science uh, at MIT, uh, out of which he went uh, directly to IBM uh, and rose uh, you know, very quickly and very prominently to the ranks. So very happy and very pleased to have you here today. Thanks again, and the floor is yours. Well, first, uh, uh, Nicola, thank you uh, so much. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. It's great. Okay, great. So thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this, this, you know, to, to be able to speak uh, with, you know, with you and to this audience on materials discovery. It's an honor and, you know, and also particularly the case, you know, given your extraordinary scientific, uh, you know, journey in this space. And, and I think it's really exciting that we get an opportunity to explore the intersection of what is happening in the world of computing and, uh, and the convergence of trends that are gonna happen and the implications to science and very specifically to, to discovery. Uh, since in these days, we don't get a, you know, a chance to travel, uh, uh, I thought I would show a picture of where I'm speaking uh, to you from, which is the headquarters of IBM Research. This is a TJ Watson Research Laboratory, which is about 45 minutes. Uh, north of New York City. Uh, I'm happy to say that as you know, we, you know, we continue the recovery from the pandemic. At present, we have about 500 scientists now that come every day to the building. But normally in its peak, we would have about 1,500 or 1,600 people that would come to the building. And it's part of a, of a global network of laboratories. I'm showing you just a few additional pictures uh, of some of the laboratories of, of IBM Research. Uh, Nicola mentioned the joint laboratory we have with MIT. Uh, that's actually a new building that is right by the T in, in Kendall Square, uh, and that we're going to be, you know, uh, occupying one of the floors on the, you know, this early September. We have this beautiful laboratory in Almaden, south of San Jose, that you see on top of a natural park in Albany, is where we do a lot of semiconductor work. You may have read about a recent breakthrough on a two nanometer uh, technology for for the future of nodes of semiconductors. That's the work we do. In Albany, of course, uh, you know, or dear, I love the Zurich lab in Ruschlikon, uh, where, you know, I'll get a chance to share some of the beautiful work happening. And I'm showing one more lab in Haifa in Israel, um, which is also a very large laboratory that, that we have. So it's about, you know, we have about 3,000 uh, researchers, wide variety of disciplines, you know, from physicists, mathematicians, and you know, biologists, computer scientists, of course, and then domains uh, where we have a core focus around cloud, uh, you know, particularly hybrid cloud, AI, quantum, semiconductors and systems and security and cryptography. 
But what brings a community in common is always the desire um, to be able to explore uh, where the world of information is going, right? What is next in the world of information um, and, uh, and computation? So that is, I think, one of the you know particularly exciting uh, you know endeavors that 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 we go on, on pursue, and I want to share with you in the context of the world of materials the implications of what's next uh, in in computing, and it is a story of not just one thing, uh, because we're witnessing the convergence of different methods to represent and process information. The world of bits that we've grown accustomed uh, to since the days of Cloud Shannon, and that has resulted in computers and supercomputers that we all use on a, on a daily basis. The world of neurons uh, and neural networks, uh, loosely inspired by the, you know, the world of biology uh, applied to information, which form the basis of AI systems. And the world of qubits, short for quantum bits, that are the basis of quantum computers. And you know, I like to point out that as profound as each of these technologies are, the most salient and most interesting aspect of this coming decade is going to be the result of what happens when they come together. And I like to summarize as a result of that, that, that the future of, of computing, it is this bits plus neurons plus qubits coming together, enabled by a hybrid uh, cloud programming environment that will result ultimately in expanding the horizon of the kinds of problems that, that they can solve. And, and really is the opportunity to conduct science and accelerate the process of finding those solutions that I wanna get a chance to be able to explore uh, with, with all of you today. And it's gonna be this intersection of this revolution in computing with the implications to, to science and, and discovery. And it is worth highlighting um, that the urgency of, of science has never been stronger. Uh, and it is driven by the complexity and the scale of the global challenges that, that we face today and will face tomorrow. And you know, whether we're dealing with the, not only the current uh, impact of the current pandemic, but you know, future ones that we may confront or climate change or food shortages or energy security, um, it requires, these challenges require us that we act uh, with unprecedented agility and speed. And to do that, I don't think there's anything sort of more impactful that we, we could all do collectively than to accelerate the rate of discovery to addressing some of these problems. And we must rely on science, not only to produce the critical breakthroughs, but also as a rigorous methodology for decision making. But the good news is that we do have the technologies with which to tackle this ambitious task. And, um, and we're gonna get a, a chance now to understand and first by mapping it to the scientific method and then to see systematically how the world of AI, a cloud and quantum can apply to accelerate the scientific method that we all uh, know and love, right? Um, we know that this process of asking questions uh, then, you know, doing research, forming hypotheses, running experiments, testing it, and sharing with the community. Uh, it's something that uh, works very well, but is an elaborate and long running process. We we're all familiar with, with that and that we've got to repeat it again and again. And that we know that it is expensive to, to conduct it. So it is an interesting question to ask how much more productive could we get if we approach the whole thing as a workflow and to sort of explore um, the opportunity of bringing these computational advances, specifically, for example, let's talk about AI, um, to really boost uh, what may be possible. Of course, I want to express this in, uh, you know, on, on some of the results and the approaches that we're taking as a continuum of a journey of using computers since the 1950s to be able to engage with them in the context of the, of the scientific method. And of course, the utilization, for example, of high performance computing in the worlds of materials and materials discovery is extremely well known and is actually one of the drivers of the reason why we built uh, supercomputers. But uh, a lot has changed also in the number of years. And, um, and I do think we're ripe for an opportunity to do things um, that are quite, quite transformative. So, so how so? Um, advances in AI, power in science, increasing automation and community-driven innovations 
are really closing the loop of scientific discovery in, um, in, in very significant ways. And this includes advances at each step uh, in the ways that we extract, integrate, and reason with knowledge at scale to better respond with questions, the use of deep generative models to automatically propose new hypotheses. So no longer about just mining the literature and organizing knowledge to assist us with the body of work that uh, is present, but actually the creative dimensions of hypothesis generation is something that can be assisted by AI, as we will show. The use of automation testing and uh, experimentation using robotic laboratories, in this case, to be able to synthesize new molecules automatically guided by AI programs. And important advances in machine representation of knowledge can also lead from the results to new questions and hypotheses that close the loop of discovery. So taking here genuine steps towards scientific advancement as a self-propelled, continuous, and never-ending process. So let's apply uh, this, this idea to um, the world of materials. And let's start by giving ourselves an objective of considering the fact that on average, uh, it takes about 10 years to discover a new material and to bring it to market. And the estimated production cost you know, of at least $10 million, you know, it can often happen that is well in excess of $100 million to do so. So, I mean, just as an example, it took 10 years from the beginning of research to the discovery of the first use of nylon, right? In a toothbrush to give a very uh, you know, practical example. So the objective that we're setting uh, is that with the new accelerated discovery approach, we could cut down the cost of this process of, of discovery to, uh, to productization by 90%, right? So, you know, could we go from like, you know, at, at least on sort of the discovery front, instead of taking, you know, many, many years, could we bring it down to one year and reduce, you know, the cost also very significant, like perhaps by a factor of 10. So let me show you a very brief video first to just frame uh, you know, the opportunity and the technologies we're gonna bring together, and then we'll explore them in a, in a little bit more, more detail. It takes approximately 10 years and $10 million from the design concept to the market for a single material. And this is a time that we cannot afford, especially in situations where we have threatening diseases that are affecting the entire humanity. RoboXN is a pioneering project that shows how the combination of three technologies, cloud, AI, and automation, can dramatically change the way we work. Imagine a chemist at home willing to make a molecule connecting to RoboRxN through a web browser, drawing the molecule, and having RoboRxN recommending the optimal synthetic route together with the starting commercial material. And finally, RoboRxN self-programming itself to execute the process in an autonomous laboratory. So with the RoboRxN technology, we are expecting to uh, accelerate profoundly the way we do material discovery. It's revolutionizing an entire field, bringing chemistry from a traditional type of business into an high tech business. So we will get a, a, a chance to unpack some of these technologies that uh, Theo uh, like, you know, from our Zurich Research Lab mentioned. But I want to, you know, first uh, put it in context of the range of implications of directing the power of all of these new computational technologies towards the physical world, to the world of, of materials. I mean, and just to give um, uh, an example, you know, we did this piece of work of trying to illuminate the range of you know, five technologies that could have a massive impact in the world within a scope of five years that we released during the time of the sustainable development goals uh, discussions that was happening during the annual conference of the UN last year. And whether we're talking about a next generation of electronic materials that are, you know, more sustainable in their production for the next generation computers and devices and gadgets, to the design of new fertilizers that are much more energy efficient in their production for agriculture, 
to better lithium battery technology. Uh, as an example, as we electrify more and more of the world and electrify transportation, it would have massive impact as well. Or being able to accelerate the discovery uh, and treatments to, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, for life-threatening um, viruses that we may want to create new antiviral uh, molecules or carbon capture uh, membranes that may be able to be installed at the point of emission um, to be able to, um, you know, uh, to do to do the, car the the capture of the CO2 emissions, as an example. So I think we can sort of all broadly agree that significant breakthroughs in the material science space across these domains would have a transformative transformative impact um, in the world. So I want to I want to pick an example to go deeper into sort of like see the loop in actions of all of the different steps. And we've picked an area where we have a lot of domain expertise within IBM research, which is the world of electronic materials, you know, very specifically the world of photoresists that are a core element of the photolithographic process that is required to make semiconductors and make chips. So let me frame first, uh, you know, the, the opportunity here for these materials and then and then we will go uh, step by step. We're building new tools to accelerate how scientists can discover new materials. Everything is a computing platform these days, not just our phones, but our watches, our cars. As computer chips become ubiquitous, we really need to make certain that all the materials that are used are as sustainable as possible. We are trying to use advanced simulation, including quantum computing, AI, deep search, and advanced automation to help us develop better and more sustainable materials that are used in the production of computer chips. More sustainable materials and manufacturing processes will enable more sustainable computing, which will enable a more sustainable planet. Um, okay, so uh, let's unpack, um, you know, how uh, these materials are utilized today in the world of semiconductors. We know that to make computer chips uh, using UV light, um, you know, we use that process to create a 3D pattern. Uh, a relief pattern in a photosensitive material called a photoresist. And this pattern in the end uh, defines the, the transistor and the interconnecting wires for the back end of the line. Now, early photoresists use the incoming light uh, to do chemistry by directly creating or breaking uh, the chemical bonds of the photoresist. But in the 1980s, IBM researchers, Joito, I mean, Ito, Frechet, and Wilson invented a new process. It was called chemically amplified photoresist. And um, they used for the first time a uh, catalytic process in semiconductor patterning. And what this happened, the result of this is that it increased dramatically the resolution and the detail that could be printed. And the key component of a chemically amplified photoresist is a photoacid generator, a PAG. And it's these photoresists that harness light to uh, translate what ultimately is a 2D uh, optical image that the lithography scanner uh, projects onto the surface of the wafer into a 3D pattern. And that's how chips, chips are made. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a rec you know this, this material has had you know, like just seminal contributions to, to enable the continuous scaling of, uh, of semiconductor for, for many, many decades. So with the new accelerated discovery approach, we're hoping to create new materials like PACs more efficiently and sustainably than we currently do by complementing and scaling human expertise of, of the chemists that formulate these kinds of materials. So let's break it down into the components of the materials discovery workflow, which we've simplified um, you know, in, in this slide that you see here. So it begins with using deep search which uh, can accelerate and speed the process by about a thousand X in terms of, you know, like using the most uh, latest and contemporary techniques in terms of the ingestion of literature at scale. So you can do about 20 pages per second per processing core, um, where of course, you know, I mean, if, if humans like, you know, contrasting it with humans probably is unfair, um, but you know, like for us, we read uh, technical literature about, you know, it takes us about like, you know, a couple of minutes for, per page at the, at the very least. Now, the second piece of it, so the first is ingest at scale. 
The second piece is uh, to drive an AI enriched simulation process that uh, can lead to have a twice as fast screening of experimental parameters in some cases and up to 40x in some others. The third step is the use of generative models to fill in the gaps. And here we've seen a 10x acceleration using generative models to identify ga gaps and create new materials concepts for tests. And finally, we get to test the results in an AI-driven driven lab. And each one of these, now we're gonna look at it um, you know, specifically so that you see actually the workflow in action. So let's look at the world of packs, right? These new material that we're trying to create, um, you know, an evolution of it with more sustainable uh, process. So the traditional way of discovering a new molecule will go something like this. Scientists would search the published literature and use what they could find, plus their own knowledge, uh, to design a molecule and, a tar and target the, the properties required. Then they will go through the iterative cycles of synthesis, characterization, and testing until we reach the satisfactory compound. And we know that this is a long process. And even when we use computers to run advanced simulations, we know that the process is long and slow and expensive, right? And here, what you're looking in this representation is at the chemical space representing um, representation for PAGs. And every dot represents a single molecule, and they're grouping color clusters where each color indicates distinct classes or families of, uh, of packs. Another way to represent this information is using a circular dendrogram, where the packs families are sorted into a phylogenic tree by chemical similarity. And that is what you're seeing on the right-hand side of, of the graph. So first, um, we're going to use deep search. Here, uh, the AI is going to help us collect what is known about the PACs from the literature. So our new technology, the IBM Corpus Conversion Service, allow us to convert PDFs into JSON documents. And then we come through the documents, digesting them and finding new connections. And we incorporate the elements into a knowledge graph that allows us to explore the published research and, uh, and also to search the curated knowledge and extract specific data. The knowledge graph that is produced can be queried uh, in a time to solution of 0.1 seconds per, uh, for queries that involve five edges uh, in a 64 million edge graph uh, that it was represented here. So the corpus conversion service actually can ingest the full PAG corpus of about 60,000 pages in less than an hour on a multi-core server. And that information was organized in a knowledge graph with 2.2 million nodes and 38 million edges of known materials. So complex queries complete, as I was mentioning, in just about 100 milliseconds. And then look at the uh, dendrogram where the PAX families are sorted by uh, chemical similarity. But notice here all the empty spaces around the outside of the ring. And this is because important data on properties of PACs for most of the compounds of interest was almost completely absent uh, from the literature. Uh, for some properties, uh, properties, the availability of data is so sparse or noisy and unreliable that it was almost useless. In other cases, the specific properties that we are um, we're using are not normally reported in a publication or a patent, right? There may be perhaps, you know, some laboratories that have it in the form of know-how. So uh, we have to augment this data set with enough data on predictive properties to train an AI model. So here we use an AI enriched simulation to provide quantitative values for important properties for the PAGs in the data set. Purple here shows the computed values for one property associated with toxicity, so LD50, in these known uh, PAC families. Blue shows the computed values for another property associated with environmental persistence or biodegradability. Those first two rings, LD50 and biodegradability, were calculating uh, by the NIH OPERA data-driven model to get the uh, Physio physiochemical properties of, of these materials. Now, the outer ring with the green data shows the computed values for one property associated with PAC photochemistry, lambda max, which is the wavelength 
at which the material has its strongest uh, uh, photon absorption. It is calculated actually using uh, expensive time dependent density functional theory methods to compute the UV absorption maximums of the pack uh, cations. And this is uh, an approximate first principle model, which could eventually be replaced by uh, quantum computing simulations, which we'll talk in, uh, in a little bit. We wanted to encapsulate the entire predictive simulation and containerize the software infrastructure in order to be able to run it and reproduce it anywhere. This is an important problem uh, in the world of science and computational methods, which is this issue of reproducibility. And uh, we think it's very important to have their correct software infrastructure such that, such that scientists who may have different computational infrastructure or access to different computational infrastructure could actually reproduce the results uh, of other teams. And that's why it's so important to containerize the software environments and the application. But here uh, we use uh, Bayesian algorithms and others to decide what materials to simulate and what tools to use for the simulation, like we did for the LD50 biodegradability and the other rings here. So in this case, the AI and the Bayesian optimization approach is used to be able to guide the high-performance computing simulations. Okay, so now once we've had the resulting augmented data set, we built an AI model to predict thousands of potential packs with better sustainability attributes. And you can see how some of the output of the generative model fits into the pack design space in the dendrogram. Remember, we have those white spaces. Now you're seeing um, you know, that dendrogram getting filled out by the use of these generative models that use as an input the computed properties that we really cared about. So these white elements of the inner ring are novel photo acid generation, generator structures that were created directly by the AI, by the generative model. So I wanted to take a, a moment to do a little digression on, on the power of generative models to move from what we've accustomed of using large scale neural networks, which is the use of classification or discrimination to the use of generation now. Now, discriminative models we're all accustomed are done to classify data, right? So neural networks and deep learning have brought in very important new capabilities for tasks that require discrimination like image recognition and NLP and speech transcription. But generative modeling goes beyond discrimination, right? And it really started to show impressive results at scratch, right? So what we're really asking the AI is to create, not just to classify. And, um, you know, and, and just as an, uh, as an example, we've seen the use of, of generative models to use, uh, that were being used to create the first AI-generated portrait that saw that Christie's in 2018. And they're being used to create extremely realistic faces, for example, of people uh, that don't exist. I'm sure many of you have, have seen examples of that. And pre-trained transformers, uh, which is one of the core technologies that get used for, for, uh, for this, this technology, combined with uh, deep generative models are used to automatically generate natural language text. And, and an example that I think you know, is, is, has become very popular uh, is uh, GPT-3 as an example of a model that where you're giving just a one sentence prompt into the large scale neural network model, it can generate anywhere between 200 to 500 word essay that a lot of people can no longer discern, right? Whether the computer generator or it was human, human written. But for us in this context, we wanna use the generative models in the world of chemistry, where the design and discovery of new molecules is faced with a chemical space that is you know, infinitely vast, right? So a key insight to make deep generative models work for chemistry is to treat chemistry like language. And in a language, we are accustomed that we have sentences and words and letters. In um, chemistry, we have uh, analogous constructs in the form of chemical properties and reactions and, and molecules. So similar to translating, let's say, English to Spanish with the use of these statistical approaches, we can translate the language of chemistry, converting reactants and reagents and products using, for example, the SMILE uh, representation to describe uh, chemical entities. In the case of language, uh, by pre-training transformers on a huge corpora of natural language documents, in some cases up to a trillion words, deep generative models can generate novel, realistic, valuable content on their own. Well, 
Similarly, by training transformers and deep generative models from chemistry using uh, the AI tools for language, just you know, borrowing with all the progress we're making in natural language processing, we can produce the same capability to generate new valuable content in chemistry, uh, which you know could be new materials designs, for example. Okay, so with that um, as an aside, um, we can use uh, this approach to create new molecules, to create new stories and arguments or images of people, places and objects that have never existed, and even generating new code, right? The world of software. And this is really the power of, of generative models. And they can provide a powerful new tool to search for candidate materials and generate hypotheses to expand the discovery space and the creativity of uh of scientists and use the material design um we can you know now bring it back to 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 the world of packs so i'm gonna you know with this aside on, on what is happening on generative models let's bring it back to uh to where we were in our in our workflow right so recall that you know we had used deep search to organize past literature and extract knowledge at scale there were properties that uh, we didn't have access to the literature. We used uh, an, an AI guided uh, simulation effort with high performance computing to be able to calculate the properties that we care about. And now we are uh, we use that uh, expanded knowledge to be able to uh, uh, create these generative models to fill in the gaps and rapidly generate 1000 pack cation candidates with targeted absorption wavelength and solubility uh, that, that we wanted. And now is where we also bring an expert in the loop technology. To use the knowledge of why, why do you need that? Because you know you need, we need the, the scientists, these tools to help uh, us as scientists and researchers do a better job is not to substitute everything that we do. So we're here, we're using the knowledge of subject matter experts to select now the best candidates that may be suitable for experimental validation. Um, the spikes highlighted here in the in the figure indicate the molecules and properties that were either directly prioritized by a human expert or highlighted based on an AI model trained by that expert. So to train that AI model, the human expert evaluates hundreds of candidate materials with simple criteria like interesting, not interesting, right? A simple classifier or feasible, not feasible. And this adjudication is used to train uh, a simple AI classifier and look, it's not perfect, but that's okay because it's just used to prioritize subsequent examples for uh, for human review. All right, so then we took one of those materials that now we've down selected forward to the next step, which is synthesizing the compound to validate its sustainability qualities and performance. And uh, synthesis is the most demanding task in making materials and requires substantial human effort. But with our recent inventions, cloud-based AI-driven autonomous labs, uh, this is, you know, I highlighted before this IBM RoboRxN for chemistry and, and IBM uh, RoboRxN, we can increase the reliability, uh, decrease the time, and achieve scalable autonomous chemical synthesis. And we use these tools to design the best synth uh, synthetic routes and implement them remotely in a robotic uh, laboratory. So here, here's a short video of the RoboRxN lab at work. It's synthesizing a pack uh, of a class that was down selected uh, from the generative model output. And this new chemistry lab that leverages the power of AI and automation to accelerate chemistry synthesis is built uh, in the hybrid cloud and can be accessed remotely. All the components were packaged uh, as OpenShift containers to run on, on this hybrid cloud environment. And with it, we show how a digital experience can be connected to the creation of, of uh, physical, physical molecules. And, and what is really nice about it is that nowadays you can create really reliable infrastructure and autonomous infrastructure that can assist chemists to uh, predict chemical reactions and execute molecules or substance synthesis literally from anywhere in the world. And this is how we achieved last November the first material using the entire accelerated discovery workflow that I just discussed about. And here, what you see is the measure mass spectrum. And you know, in in astronomy, uh, the the first light, you know, the first picture by a new telescope uh, might not be scientifically important, but it shows that the telescope works, right, and brings with it the promise of of discoveries to come. And in a way, the same is true, right? In um, 
you know, in, in particle physics, for example, with the first collisions in a new particle accelerator. And here we've achieved the first material where deep search form a knowledge base of PACs, AI enriched simulation augmented this with the important data for sustainability and performance properties, a generative model proposed candidate, uh, potential candidates with targeted properties, um, and then expert in the loop technologies help prioritize the candidates. And finally, the autonomous lab designed and executed the correct synthetic procedure to produce a targeted pack. What is interesting is that the generative model not only help us generate the hypothesis, but it actually generates the step-by-step -step sequence of chemical synthesis that gets then uh, processed by the robotic lab. So this is really exciting to now see the whole loop um, uh, in action. I'll also highlight that RoboRxN is available now for the whole community to use and that over 23,000 people, uh, chemists have used it to predict over two and a half million molecule, uh, I mean, chemical reactions. There's been more than 900 synthesis that have been completed since just October of last year. And just last month, we um, unveiled uh, a new model for sustainable chemistry, which could help with the development of environmental, uh, environmentally friendly processes. So this just shows also how hybrid cloud is becoming a key technological factor to revolutionize uh, several fields. And now anywhere where you can have an internet connection, in a way you have a chemical lab in your hands and, and you know, just how powerful that is. So I want to touch on the on the last element on the you know scientific and technical computational spaces uh, in relation to the world of materials, and and it's a complementary technology to what we just talked about, and it also is going to have a big impact in the world of accelerating discovery. And what it recognizes is that there are classes of problems that require a time to be solved that grows exponentially with the size of the problem. And therefore, we require, if we want to be able to make them tractable, exponential speed ups in, in computation. From an information theory perspective, we can divide classes of problems that our computers can solve into easy problems and hard problems. And the truth is that sophisticated, you know, and as sophisticated as our classical computers have become, they can only solve, from an information theory perspective, these kinds of easy problems. The hard problems, which include chemistry and simulated materials, cannot be solved exactly with classical computers. And the best we can do is to uh, approximate the solutions. And look, sometimes these approximations work very well, uh, but you know, but they they tend to be obviously because of the nature of approximations, you know, at least uh, you know less reliable than than what we could achieve, and. Um, and there's another technology that is the reason why we're so excited about the world of quantum computing that um, alters the landscape of what could be possible to be solved. And, and that is the promise of, of quantum. Now, it's, I just wanna make very clear that we do not expect to solve all problems that are known to be hard, but that for carefully selected applications, we will see them providing big benefits. And those problems, that are intractable in classical computers because of the runtime growth exponentially, uh, but that they admit quantum algorithms with a runtime that instead scale with a small constant power of the size of the problem is what we are uh, pursuing. Now, the way we use circuits, these quantum circuits, to do things differently in quantum computing so that we can solve some of these unsolvable problems with conventional method is by first, you know, I'm just trying to give you an anatomy for how an algorithm in quantum computing works, is by, you know, uh, you start by having uh, n qubits in your machine. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll show you a roadmap of where we are. We're gonna, uh, you know, deploy our 127 qubit machine this year to give you a sense of where state of the art is. But let's say we keep it simple and that, you know, we have a two qubit machine. So the, the, the power of the quantum computer is we get to create an equal superposition of two to the n states where n is the number of qubits uh, by applying quantum gates. Now those states have probability amplitudes that can be positive or negative. That is, they have faces associated with them. And this is the key to how an algorithm works and provides the speed, the speed up. So the first thing is we put the computer in a superposition of all available states. If we had a two qubit quantum computer, it will be two to the power of two, that's four. So we would have four states. In this case, we're showing a, a larger number of states 
uh, that you see here represented by the pink little moons in this sphere. Now, the next step is we got to encode uh, the problem. So we, we got to bring in data from the outside world that we want to compute over using the quantum computer. And what this in practice means is uh, altering those states, in this case, depicted here by a phase rotation of, of each one of these little moons. So notice that instead of just having those pink uh, spheres, now you have some blue and purple spheres. So just interpret them as uh, rotations of those moons. Now with that problem encoded, uh, the art of running the correct set of operations uh, that form a quantum circuit is one that interferes. Remember, we talked about each one of these states has an amplitude and a phase. So therefore, we can interfere those states in such a way that the right answer is mixed, is maximized, and the answers uh, that we care less about um, get, get minimized. So this, of course, is a process operation that is vastly, vastly different to what you get, you get to do in classical computing. So suppose that to find a solution, you have to explore a very large number of computational paths. So imagine that you start with an input in the left-hand side of the diagram, and you move in one direction or another, depending on some probability. So you have two possibilities at each point. And from each one, you get two more and so on. So this keeps repeating and, and uh, so that you have a very large number of possible paths, many of which lead to the wrong solution, which are the pink circles uh, at the end of the diagram, and a few leading to the right one, right, which are the, the blue circles. So what a quantum computer does is interfere those paths so that the paths leading to the incorrect solution interfere destructively and cancel out, while the ones containing the solution uh, interfere constructively and amplify. Those are the things that classical computers cannot do. And that massive cancellation of wrong paths to interference give quantum computers an incredible power to find the answer to certain problems more efficiently than the conventional computers that we use today. Now, until very recently, quantum computing was not accessible to the broader scientific community. It was the realm of a handful of research teams in a few labs around the world that could build them. It looked like what you see on the right hand side. That's a picture of Jerry Chow, actually, uh, you know, like controlling the, the microwave, uh, you know, equipment, right, to send the pulses into the superconducting uh, machine. And that's a photo circa 2015. And, and you know, look, it's illustrative. It reminds you a little bit of the computers of the 1940s, right? That require people moving cables and dials to perform a calculation. But that changed in uh, May 2016 when um, IBM was the first company in the world to build programmable quantum computers and make them available uh, to the world through the cloud. And no more cables and tuning. Uh, you can just sit in front of your terminal and design and create a quantum program. And since then, the scientific community has used our systems to publish over 500 research papers. And people uh, are running, you know, any given day now, like 2 billion quantum circuits every single day in our, uh, you know, over 20 quantum computers that we have over the cloud. And uh, this is what, you know, this is a model of what our quantum computer uh, that we build look like today. We use in IBM superconducting qubits, there's different ways to implement quantum computers. And you can see how the inside of one of our superconductor quantum uh, computers look like, uh, which are really beautiful, by the way. This is the inside of a cryostat. We cool the bottom to near absolute zero to about 15 millikelvins. And these sort of beautiful chandelier with golden coaxial cables that you see here, those coaxial cables is what send the signals down to the superconducting quantum processors. Uh, we use microwave pulses that operate at about five gigahertz to be able to create the superposition, entanglement, and interference operations um, that allow us to execute the, uh, the quantum circuits. We were the first to build a fully integrated quantum computing system, like you see in this model, and that was stable and reliable enough for industry. And in doing so, we took quantum computers outside of our labs into the, the commercial world. And this is what the environment that we provided the world looks like, right? You can sit in front of your terminal, you write your program, you send the zeros and ones over the internet. Um, uh, we convert them, as I mentioned, to uh, these you know, uh, gigahertz pulses. They travel down the superconducting coaxial cables. Uh, then they interact and they couple uh, with uh, or qubits in such a way that we can actually control very precisely the evolution of the quantum circuits 
Then we take the signal, we amplify it again, we convert it back to zeros and ones, and we return the answer back to, uh, to the user. And here I'm just zooming in a little bit so you can see the interior uh, of one of these uh, machines are really, truly magnificent pieces of physics and, and engineering, right? And uh, they're just you know, a, a remarkable new scientific instrument and computational capability uh, that we get to use as part of our arsenal now to conduct science. Um, so it's been a really amazing progress of what happened in the last decade, uh, you know, going from chips that were wire bonded by hand and not reproducible at all to uh, the chips that we create today that you see on the right hand side, right, that go inside IBM uh, Quantum System 1. And um, so it's just a, a testament of how much uh, progress has happened. And, you know, and now we've deployed some of these fully integrated systems in addition to the IBM environment. Actually, today we are uh, unveiling is, uh, you know, Chancellor Angela Merkel and uh, the chairman and CEO of IBM, Arvin, and are announcing, you know, the, the you know, sort of like the, the launch operationally of the IBM Q system one in Germany. Uh, which is being announced today. In about a month, we also have deployed another uh, full quantum computer in, in uh, University of Tokyo uh, in Japan. And uh, we've also announced, you know, like very strategic partnerships with the Cleveland Clinic to apply them to the future of life sciences. But, you know, over the last five years, we've built over 30 quantum computers. Uh, we have over 20 available to the broad community around the world today. And you're seeing here how the evolution of the community has grown in the last five years. So you're, here, uh, you're seeing here users around the world running their quantum programs, running on actual quantum hardware, right? And those are the blue circles. And, uh, and the blue line at the bottom is people actually uh, implementing things for real quantum hardware. Over 860 billion quantum circuits have been executed so far. And over 300,000 people are learning how to program uh, in this new world. And the way we see the future um, for the community in quantum is one that is a frictionless environment. And um, we sometimes like to call it abstraction without trivial, trivialization, right? And what we mean by that is that we want the inter intricacies of quantum computing to kind of disappear, right? That people don't need to know quantum physics to benefit from the power of quantum computers and to make it really easy for developers to leverage uh, this, this resource. So, you know, this is how we think will be consumed. You'll use your favorite programming language, let's say Python, uh, no new languages. Behind the scenes, there will be uh, libraries that get to be accelerated in terms of mathematical calculations. They will find the right quantum circuits over the cloud, get mapped to the right quantum computer to execute that circuit, and then return the answer back to the user in a transparent manner. So maybe, you know, you're using a Jupyter notebook to your calculations, and just it will be just power behind the scenes. I mean, and just to show an extreme example of the level of embed of a quantum runtime, uh, we've done this demonstration of, of doing it like in Excel, right? Not that, you know, I think mean, that's how people are going to do a lot of, you know, scientific calculations, but nonetheless, it's just to make the point that in this example, you could be in an environment like Excel and benefit from the power of quantum computing behind the, uh, the, the scenes. And in this case, we show the example of simulating chemistry in an Excel spreadsheet. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a little bit extreme for that, but it's a fun way to sort of like understand that, that you know, we will use these quantum circuits behind the scenes. So where are the range of applications where we will see quantum circuits being embedded in our software programs? Well, there are three broad classes of areas where we're going to see an impact. The first is, of course, simulating quantum systems. That was the original Richard Feynman idea, right? A proposal of you want to model nature, build a machine that works like nature. The second one is to solve algebraic problems that are relevant, of course, for the world of machine learning. And I don't have to tell you how many industries use some form of machine learning methods nowadays, uh, or also to apply them to differential equations, which they are everywhere in, in business as well and, uh, and in science. And the third area, in addition to algebraic problems and simulating quantum systems, is the world of uh, quantum walks. And these are problems where you encode the structure of the problem that you're trying to solve in a graph or a lattice, and you move through it uh, from node to node, depending on, uh, on a probability distribution that is manipulated through interference. And this is expected to be useful in network problems, and many people have proposed it for energy transporting processes like photosynthesis as well. So these broad classes of applications is what now uh, over 150 members are part of the IBM Quantum Network, 
uh, are now exploring, right? They're investigating use cases like boosting the classification of classical data and machine learning training, simulating materials for semiconductor manufacturing, uh, opportunities for improving fraud detection, performing risk analysis, uh, or simu simulating photochemical processes for, for material design. And you can see some of the broad range of companies and industry leaders and national laboratories and universities that are part of, of this journey uh, uh, with us. Now, we've also laid out a roadmap for what's going to happen this decade. And uh, our roadmap is to develop this frictionless platform. Uh, we released it uh, this past February. At the bottom, you see our hardware roadmap. And we are on track to release uh, our Eagle processor that I mentioned earlier before, earlier in the talk, with 127 qubits uh, later this year. As we move from there to Osprey next year, that will have 433 qubits. And then Condor in 2023 with over 1,000 qubits. What we'll be doing is improving the electronics that we use to control the qubits using technology that reduces the number of lines uh, that uh, goes to the qubits to control their states, uh, moving to fit more of the lines to control the, uh, the qubit chip, improve the packaging, and reduce the size and the cost of the electronics. So all of those things have to come in parallel to produce these kinds of systems. Now, the software development roadmap on top of it provides the tools for increasing higher levels of abstraction, from providing users the ability to build their own circuits uh, from libraries, to uh, Qiskit application modules. And we will dramatically speed up the execution of circuits with Qiskit runtime. And the beta version of it was released last month. I'll show you in a minute. And next year, we will enable dynamic circuits to reduce uh, computational resources for algorithms and applications. And we will continue building uh, from there at higher and higher levels until we integrate quantum computing and HPC in a frictionless development platform. And um, I want to show you, uh, look a little bit closer into this Qiskit runtime because it actually is going to deliver a massive acceleration in terms of your ability to use quantum computers inside um, uh, a workload, right? And um, you know, just to simplify what Qiskit runtime is, is the total time required to run a workload. It's basically as, as simple as, as that. So we are accelerating the runtime by a factor of 100 times by changing the way quantum programs are handled. Programs um, use nested loops uh, running back and forth across the cloud. And uh, we're moving those loops from the left-hand side uh, on the cloud where they run on a user computer. That's you know, how people have been using these quantum systems in the last five years to the cloud, to the right-hand side of the cloud. And we're putting them behind the scenes and, uh, and close to the quantum systems. And with it, you'll be able to come with your own program or a container for your job and run it orders of magnitude faster. And let's just show you a very short video uh, with Jay Gambetta, our VP of quantum computing and IBM fellow, to just show you how it works through an example. For this problem, the first step is the user needs to define a molecule and its electronic structure. The next step, the user needs to specify the quantum program and the circuits that will be used. Then the user constructs the VQE program that they want to run. This is based on the QuizKit runtime as we talked about. Now they simply just call solve. So now here's where the fun starts. The quantum computer is now this quantum system plus a hybrid classical server plus the user's computer. Let's start with the user in San Francisco. The runtime program now goes to the user's computer through the cloud, and it actually, in our case, goes to the IBM cloud that's in Austin, where it's authenticated and sent to the IBM Quantum Data Center in Poughkeepsie. Here, the runtime manager starts. It sets up this new container program, and this does the classical computing, and it makes the circuits to be run. As you see, there's lots of circuits that are being sent to the quantum systems. These are run on our quantum systems, and the results come back, and you'll see there's lots of zeros and ones. Now it goes to the classical server again, and it processes those results. And if the algorithm calls, it resends those circuits through to the quantum system, and it comes back again, processes the results, gets the final answer, and sends it back to the user that's in San Francisco. And now they see, as in this example, the chemistry plot. 
So back in uh, 2018, when we simulated lithium hydride and calculated the energy landscape with uh, intraatomic distance using techniques to mitigate errors um, in, the, in the solutions obtained. And just to give you a sense of like an experiment that uh, involved 3.1 billion quantum circuits to conduct and you know, was in the cover of nature. So a typical useful problem on a quantum computer is gonna require millions or billions of circuits to be run through the quantum processors. So systems need to be able to run that large number of circuits fast enough so you can get to your solutions in a reasonable amount of time, in hours or days, not in months or years. So circuit runtime is extremely important to make this practical. If you were to do that experiment uh, from where you're now with the old Qiskit execution time, that would take 45 days to run. With the new Qiskit runtime, it takes nine hours. And that's the kind of difference that, um, that we're gonna still seeing in, um, in some of these problems. By the way, incidentally, you know, this is the reason why we like superconducting technology so much, uh, so much so and what we've made the bet on it, you know, compared to other technologies like ions, because this issue of running hundreds of millions or billions of circuits iteratively, um, you know, on a you know on a technology that is much much lower, uh, that can be as many as hundred to thousand x lower than superconducting technology, it's a real practical limitation uh, to make quantum computing viable. So quantum computing uh, will join forces with AI to help us improve materials discovery and chemistry. And, and let me show you an example of like now bringing some of these worlds together. Simulating the quantum mechanical aspects of, of nature was of course the original value proposition of quantum computing and uh, is one of the biggest hopes for this computing paradigm. And, and this involves the example, um, for example, solving the problem of interacting fermions where the electrons are mapped to qubits to do the simulation. And it promises to achieve more accurate and precise uh, simulations for the design of new materials. And because of that, we envision in the future inserting this technology to work in tandem with the AI enriched simulation step of for the materials discovery loop that we discussed before. For example, replacing the time dependent functional uh, density functional theory calculations that, that we alluded to. So one way in which we're accelerating the time to get there is by combining quantum and classical computations to build circuits where we adapt or choose gates based on the outcome of intermediate measurements. So this allows us to complete tasks more efficiently and obtain higher quality of, of solutions. So what we're doing here is trading off classical and quantum resources to allow us to scale the size of the problem that we can address today. So imagine that, that you want to do a complex simulation with a large circuit. Say it needs 100 qubits uh, and a long circuit. So imagine that you only have a quantum computer of half the size, like the ones we have today. Can you solve that problem in that half size machine? If your problem has the right symmetries and you trade off classical and quantum resources, the answer is yes. For example, if there are subsections that are only weakly entangled among them, you can split that circuit into smaller circuits, requiring only have as many qubits as a full circuit. You run each subroutine separately on a small quantum computer, and then you combine the outputs using um, classical post-processing. So this method was tested in a simulation of water. The Hamiltonian has 14 orbitals with five electrons each. So exploiting properties of the problem, the number can be reduced to 10 qubits. And now you can split them in five spin up and five spin down to have five qubits simulating 10 orbitals. And you can get very good accuracy in the energy profiles as compared to the exact full configuration interaction calculation, which is the green line here depicted in the graph, especially near equilibrium where the entanglement between the spin ups and the spin down is the weakest. And this is the most accurate simulation of the water molecule done on hardware, uh, on quantum hardware today. And it's evidence that you can use this approach to extend the size of molecular simulations by trading off quantum and classical compute to expand the computational reach of, of the systems. So I'm summarizing here the resources needed to solve some problems of science and industrial importance. Um, high temperature superconductivity is a model of transport of electricity with ultra low loss. Uh, the Heisenberg model describes nearly all magnets. 
Uh, 10 years ago, we had only one to two qubits and could only do a single gate. Today, we have 65 qubits and we will have 127 by the end of this year, and we can do around 1,000 gates. We advanced by orders of magnitude in the last 10 years, and we expand uh, to continue or accelerate that trend. In our hardware roadmap, from Eagle with 127 qubits to Osprey with 433 to Condor with 1,121, we're only talking about physical qubits. If we do not implement error correction and can maintain the current level of performance as we increase the number of qubits, we should move along the horizontal line uh, as shown. But that is not enough, right? We need to lower the error rate. If we succeed in lowering the physical error rate in the operations we perform in the qubits enough to be able to implement quantum error correction, say to the level of an error per 10,000 operations, in 1,121 qubits Condor, we could encode either a two distance 13 logical qubits um, with uh, an error per 10 million operations uh, on average. Or we could lower the distance slightly uh, to nine and encode four logical qubits capable of performing hundreds of thousands of operations. And so we need to keep scaling devices to move up and to the right in this plot. But, and here's where, you know, the creativity and the breakthroughs need to come in too. If we could find codes with a ratio of physical qubits to logical qubits constant and as small as possible, allowing us to encode many qubits per block of physical qubits, which also give an exponential error suppression and efficient decoding. That's the question. Can we do that, right? And, and when that happens, then we can move faster with less resources. And we're really working hard to understand this. And if they're possible, we're, we're going to find them, right? And, um, but as you can see, about 100 qubits capable of performing hundreds of thousands to about a million operations would allow us to do very interesting things that are out of reach of classical computers. So in summary, supercomputers, quantum computers, and AI systems all tying it all together to the hybrid cloud. These are really powerful technologies that are gonna allow us to accelerate the process of discovery, of discovery of new materials um, and other science and industry workforce, right? This is this world that I was describing before, right? Of the convergence of bits, neurons and qubits orchestrated in a way to help us deal with mission critical applications and scientific discovery. So here's my final reflection about why all of this matters. We are witnessing, right, um, in a way that is very personal and visceral to all of us, right, to all humans, the implications of what it will mean that we have been able to accelerate the discovery of a new vaccine from the average time uh, of historical average of about 14 years when a vaccine was able to be discovered at all. And for some diseases, let's remember that the answer has been never, we haven't been able to discover a vaccine, to in this context to do it in under a year. So think about the power of compressing this time to discovery to each one of our lives. So it's really time, and, uh, and you know, Nicola alluded to it in the introduction, to really reinvest in science. So, you know, I've been a passionate advocate of it is time to increase the aggregate levels of investments in our society in science. And also that we accelerate the return of those investments by compressing the time to discovery using the very powerful technology that science itself has allowed us to create. And if you want to explore a little bit more our vision that I share with you today about this world and this new era of accelerated discovery, I'll point you to research.ibm.com where we published late last year, the science and technology outlook for 2021 that is very, very much focused uh, on that vision. And I wanna be able to thank you for your attention and I will stop here, thank you. Thank you, Daria, for uh, the fantastic uh, visionary lecture of today. and. Uh, very, very insightful. Um, so people are welcome to raise hand uh, or to ask uh, questions in the question and answer. Uh, I wanted also to say it's, uh, it's uh, very fitting because uh, uh, this lecture is embedded uh, in a, a summer school 
on quantum computing hardware and software. So we are the peers to crazy stance so today of the of the summer school, but there has been a lot of enthusiasm and this was organized by the students at ETFL and the ETH. Um, and I'll, I'll start off with a question myself. I couldn't resist uh, because, uh, you know, I really uh, um, love uh, your role uh, both uh, as an industry leader, uh, but also as a science policy maker. And, uh, you know, if I now, for a moment, go back uh, to the early part of your talk, uh, you know, you really show uh, the power that is coming from transforming the entire scientific uh, enterprise into a digital infrastructure, you know, the, the learning, the making, the discovering, the acceleration, and so on. Uh, and in all of this, uh, you know, the, 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 the weak spot, the bottleneck, uh, is the physical world. I mean, so, you know, the experiments, Robo, uh, RxN is a fantastic uh, example, but, uh, you know, transforming our physical infrastructure to be able to handshake, uh, you know, with uh, the data, with the computing, and so on, is a you know major challenge, and I wonder you know if the NSF, uh, what in the US is happening, uh, what you as uh, IBM are thinking in terms of you know engaging the physical infrastructure of science. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question, and uh, I I will sort of like reflect that that in the broader concept of industry, right? The world of manufacturing, right? And uh, all of physical instrumentation that we have around there. When people talk about industry 4.0 or industry 5.0, it is that story of edge and, you know, uh, and compute coming together with the right security, the right permissions and the right productivity, but to tie that into a big system of systems, right? So within specifically in the world of, of research, I do think that there is a very exciting journey, right, for the, you know, uh, to, to be able to bring scientific instruments that historically were air gap and isolated, right, and, you know, not really tethered and connected to large scale computing and um, I'm, I'm modernize them from that perspective, right? I mean, you got to do it like with security and productivity and all that stuff. But I think there's a trend to say, how do we make more and more of the equipment that is available? especially to enable collaborators, right? To be able to access uh, the instruments in a different way. And the, and the value is not only the remote access, the value now is the interoperability and the connection that then happens between this kind of like computational methods and this world of digital with the physical world, right? And, and, and then that unleashes a whole new set of opportunities and creativity, right? Uh, because, I mean, as an example, I mean, if you, if you go and if you look at, you know, an SEM, right, or, you know, any kind of like imaging instrumentation, well, the moment that you start also having access to, uh, you know, really large amounts of compute for AI and so on, and you tie them together, you know, you have the opportunity to enable things like super resolution and other approaches around that in terms of the imaging of things. So this creativity that happens when we connect things and when we connect disciplines, we know that. But it's not just uh, the people piece of it is why we go to conferences and we go to different institutions and collaborate with one another. But if we create also the collaboration of our physical infrastructure, right, uh, then that multiplies the creativity of all of us as a community, right? I'm looking very much forward to this realization. Let me take a few live questions and I'll also read the question from the question and answer. Uh, so I've unmuted uh, Louis Ponet. Uh, please uh, uh, go ahead uh, with your question. Hi, Dario. Thank you very much for this great talk. Uh, really impressive. So coming back a bit to this reinvesting uh, back into science. Uh, so you showed this very nice workflow that where you started with like data uh, acquisition, let's say through, you know, scraping of PDFs and so on. Um, and then, you know, filling in the gaps and also using it like, let's say, um, to compute very many properties in, in, you know, I would say a high throughput kind of way um, to, to, you know, get to some final uh, interesting results. So I was wondering, um, are any of these tools, uh, you know, open source or are there plans to bring them open source, you know, to bring this sort of reproducibility and so on more to like, uh, because I know there are some efforts in Europe and so on to, to basically come up with similar tools to that. Um, yeah. 
Yes, so so that's right. So a, a, a huge trend that like we all need to be able to support is a lot of these core techniques make them available in open community. I mean, so for example, I mean, I'll start with quantum as an example, like, uh, you know, Qiskit, right, which is the world's most popular environment to, uh, uh, for quantum uh, development. It's an open source project, right? Mm -hmm. And there's contributors from all over the world and so on. If you look at the use of generative models, right, for AI, uh, in general, I would say in the AI community, by and large, a lot of the core algorithms are open, right? Yeah. And the open source, the differentiation ends up happening in the ability to curate data sets mm, and computation, yes. but the algorithms themselves tend to be tend to be on the open. Yeah. Um, I think that that's a really, you know, so yeah, we're very committed to that. And I think that that's a very positive thing and it's a way to make everything better. Um, I would say that the challenge, in my opinion, of serving what happens in there, this issue of reproducibility is a big deal, though, mm -hmm. right, in the world of AI. I, I agree with you, and I'm very concerned about that. And, and, but the challenge is, and this is why investments are so important, the challenge tends to be less about, like, that somebody has a magical algorithm that no one else has. Mm -hmm. The challenge has to do much more with access to the computers themselves, mm -hmm. right, and to the data sets themselves. So right. I think we got to um, have a very, very focused effort that for universities and, um, and uh, you know, all their research laboratories, that there is enough infrastructure mm -hmm. to be able to perform state of the art work, not only to reproduce what may be happening in, in industry and private sector, but also to push the frontiers on their own right. And I do think we have seen in the world of AI an erosion of competitiveness of the scientific endeavor when things require large amount of compute or large mm -hmm. data sets when they're not available. And that's a problem we need to address. Okay, yeah, great, thank you. Thank you. Let me take a question from the question and answer. So you ask about the generative models for materials design, because you wanted to know if say physics is integrated in the generative model. That is, he asked, do you only explore uh, the materials databases and do deep search, or you also include uh, theories and simulations uh, in your generative models? Yeah, so, so you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, state of the art uh, AI technician generation end up in hybrid models, of course, right? And if you know something and, you know, and you can screen things because you know, you know, the physics of it, you can down select. But I would say the general trend though, of what a lot of endeavors are is to do things that require uh, you know, less and less prior knowledge and more and more finding the structure of the problem by careful uh, selection of the learning environment of the data. So obviously by, by curating with you know, high quality, so for example, it made a huge difference in the creation of RoboRxN, the use of patents as a source of data. Um, and, and the reason is because typically people patent things that have already, you know, gotten things to work, right? You know, at least they're supposed to uh, realize things in practice. So therefore that curation that people had done over long periods of time of, you know, molecules that work made a huge difference in the creation then generative models that, that do that properly. So, um, so there's not a massive amount of, you know, chemistry, you know, prior knowledge and so on. It is, it's embedded in the data. And what you're trying to get is to find the representation uh, of that uh, through the large scale neural network, right? So, so in some way you're learning the physics of the chemistry in the embeddings. Uh, I mean, the downside of it, right? There's, there's an aspect that is not so pleasing about it, which is there's no closed form representation of it, right? It's, it's sort of like hidden. Uh, behind the scenes. So there's a price you're paying, right, from the interpretability um, of these kinds of systems compared to the much more analytical forms of expressions that were accustomed in the past. But you gain a lot too uh, around it. So, so my personal view is that you don't, you know, you shouldn't throw the baby with the bathwater, right, is, is when you have knowledge, right, in close form and analytical, use it. <laughs> And then there's a piece of data and it's about bringing the best of both worlds together. You know, I, I'm not an orthodox, you know, some people in the AI community is like, it has to be no prior knowledge. It has to be the things like, why? There are things we know about the world, use it, right? And it seems kind of silly sometimes to, uh, you know, to get into those kinds of religious words, right? Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll take another question from the chat that is probably 
Uh, more related to the MIT Watson lab, and Marco Fornari is asking, uh, when changing a paradigm at the level that you have described, uh, you know, it requires a corresponding transformation of education. Uh, yeah. Do you think, uh, you know, there is a way that we are teaching science or we should teach science in a different way because of, uh, you know, all what you have shown? Yes, I really believe that. And I'll tell an anecdote. Uh, I mean, uh, it's a story of the College of Computing at MIT. So yeah. you, uh, I mean, and, and, and Nicole, you know this, but it's an interesting aspect precisely related to this question, which is what is the nature of, of education moving forward? So a few years ago, uh, MIT went through this process of, you know, they concluded that they wanted to create a new college and it was gonna be the most significant change that they had done in academic structure in probably 50 years or so. And they thought long and hard, right, uh, about what to name it. Uh, and they ended up concluding to name it the College of Computing with a very simple idea, simple but profound, right, which is computing with a capital C, which is in the future, every profession, be that of an architect or an economist or a physicist or an engineer, will be their discipline plus computing. They didn't want to tell themselves to say it's AI or this because the things keep changing, right? It's AI and quantum and this, but like computing writ large, right? In the broadly understood, is your domain, your discipline assisted by that. And that, you know, the disciplines, of course, it's not about removing, you know, the colleges of like the, the areas, but that you needed a horizontal so that there would be a curriculum, education, communities around it, you know, seminars, expertise that allows everybody to blend these two worlds. And, and I think like, you know, we can debate it, but I think the, the vector is in the right direction of that. I think, I think the world is in that direction and that does have implications for how we are educated and how we will conduct our professions into the future. So uh, it's a great question. I really believe that we need, but, but you know, for every example of what may happen at, you know, EPFL or ETH or MIT or places like that, you know, we have a lot of work to do around the world to um, to be able to realize this full vision, right? Because the rate of speed of computational advances is advancing a lot very quickly. And we need to be able to um, focus a lot on skills and education. I, I really think that that's the gating factor. It's not going to be technology. It's going to be skills and education at scale to make a difference. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, let me uh, unmute uh, Daniel Marchand is uh, asking a question from uh, the chat, uh, Daniel. Please. Yeah, I was wondering if maybe I could ask, so you say you have a system that, uh, first off, great talk, I loved it. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on what your system is that digests papers? Is it like a transformer network? Is it a combination of sort of Watson knowledge-based domain? What is it that's digesting these papers exactly? Yeah, so it's a it's a whole combination now of techniques. But I mean, you know, you begin you begin with uh, both NLP and computer vision techniques, right? I mean, NLP, of course, now you can use, you know use transformer technologies, etc. Because the text part, while hard, it's improved a lot. The harder part is the diagrams of scientific papers. So you have tables, you have uh, you know plots and things of the uh, things like mm. that. And to, and to be able to, so, so the first piece is you do sort of like a core segmentation of, of the paper. Like you gotta figure out, like you treat it like an image almost. And you say, what's the abstract? What are the figures? What are the captions? Where are the reference? Where is the text? Where are equations, et cetera. Once you're able to do that, you can use the best techniques from AI, you know, to do the text analysis piece, to do the, you know, reading an equation and understanding what it means to be able to extract data from graphs and so on. That's what took many years of work. And it's not like it's perfect. And remember also in the literature, sometimes you have high resolution PDF. Sometimes you just have, you have to do OCR, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's been scanned. That presents another complexity, right? Because you have to do a pure image recognition based approach um, to the whole problem. But it yeah. Uh, with the photos now, is it translating them just directly to a chemical composition or is it translating to like abstract neural thought space that you feed into the generative model? Yeah, so you can do you can do both like once you so so let me complete the previous one and then I'll go. Sorry, yeah. So, so no, just very quick. So so what you then do once you are able to sort of like extract just the raw aspects of it, you do need to do some form of knowledge representation, right? Because you got to put it together in some graph, 
right uh, in uh, in some mechanism that you can do then fast querying, right, and be able to traverse the nodes, right, efficiently around mm -hmm. them. So that's like one one point mm -hmm. around. Then on the se second topic is like so that's just past past knowledge uh, from it. Then on the generative models. So for example, I showed the example in chemistry where you are translating, like if you if you say, for example, at the diagram of a molecule, you are trying, you are, you know, mapping it to a smiles representation, which is just a string of letters. Mm. And then you use NLP techniques to basically treat that as a language, you know, I mean, to first order is like a language you don't know, right? It's mm. like it was, you know, whatever, Korean or something like that. It's like, well, here's a string of, <laughs> of things I don't know. And, uh, and my task of building uh the the network is to be able to if i see enough examples to sort of discover the embeddings of what the symbols means and the transformation between the symbols so so that's the example i mean we've seen people that speak neither korean nor chinese that build machines that you know translate korean into chinese yeah. so 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 this is kind of like a similar process right is like how do you do that in the world of chemistry and actually it turns out that you can do it okay great thanks a lot Thank you. Uh, I'll take uh, just uh, two or three more questions uh, because I'm horrified at thinking how much we are costing IBM for all of your time. But uh, let's say Sabine Corbell uh, from uh, the question and answer says, uh, thank you very much uh, for the great talk. Uh, would you be able to say something about uh, if and how uh, modeling either classical or uh, with quantum computing uh, has been already involved in this, uh, vaccine discovery? Has it been involved in the past? Or will it be involved in the future? I think that goes very much with the COVID-19 uh, uh, HPC initiative that we mentioned uh, before. Yeah, so I, I, I think, look, uh, the, the, the current vaccines, particularly the mRNA uh, processes, involve uh, the, the key technology that were used was a sequencing piece, right? Like, you know, fast sequencing and, and making that uh, available, of course, you know, the sequencing piece, you know, gets, has a computational dimension of it. But then it was like the previous, you know, platform of, of mRNA that was used for the vaccine discovery. Now, what has been used in the context of, for example, the High Performance Computing Consortium that, um, that we established is there's been a tremendous work of simulation and AI work in understanding the core structure of the virus, uh, specifically also the, uh, the, you know, the spike protein that is present in, in the virus, as well as, for example, in the design and exploration of small molecules that can also bind to it. So that has implications to the development of antivirals and, uh, and therapeutic and treatment techniques, not necessarily the vaccine itself, but like you know, uh, treating uh, it as well. And then there's been a tremendous amount of work also in understanding, uh, you know, patient trajectories, right? So because we know that, like, as, as people have different comorbidities and, um, you know, uh, they have different conditions, um, you can sort of, like, go down the road where there can be, like, different implications for it. So in the modeling in the evolution, the personalization of the evolution um, of, of treatments and vaccines on the specific patient trajectories, that's another area where we've seen a lot of great computational uh, amount of work um, that is happening. And then there's been sort of like very interesting things as well. You remember when there was a lot of challenges with ventilators and access to them. So for example, there were like, you know, really interesting simulation work, you know, and I work around how can you split efficiently ventilators, right? You know, like from a single machine uh, to be able to do that. They were very careful work are also about airflow uh, for hospitals. You know, and what is the degree of isolation that you need to provide with, between, you know, beds and environments, you know, and the use of air conditioning. So there's been all sorts of things around the periphery of the whole treatment and pandemic and epidemiological models, etc. But in the vaccine itself that ended up being developed, um, what's remarkable when you read about this story was done so quickly from the time of sequencing, right, and when the Chinese team published the sequence in the NIPS until the very first implementation uh, using mRNA that actually in that translation did not require a computational method beyond the processing of the genomic sequencing. Thank you, Dario. I think this is very fitting also given, you know, the time that we have all been going through. Um, I think we are, as I said, very grateful for your time. And this was really 
a wonderful talk. There are also so many other questions in the question and answer and the chat, uh, but I also know that you have a very busy corporate schedule. Uh, so I just uh, thank you on behalf of all the students of the Quantum Computing School, on behalf of Marvel, and we'll keep watching and rewatching your talk. Uh, and we look very much forward uh, to seeing you in person, hopefully in the future. Thanks Thank again. you, Nicola. Thank you again for inviting me. It's been a great delight always to see you and, uh, and to be with all of you today. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone. And thank you all for participating.